Hello and welcome to Own Coronary Physiology Cardio Webinar Series. Please subscribe to our channel to receive most recent webinars related to coronary physiology, assessment, and innovation. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Shad Reyes and welcome to the cardio webinar series from All in Coronary Physiology. In this webinar series, as always, we focus on physiology and uh, especially in the coronary using uh, uh, recent technology. But at this time, we are kind of taking a different angle. We are focusing on the peripheral vascular bed, which is something new, something innovative, but has been having some trend recently and there's some literature about it. So uh, before we start, I would like to thank the sponsored Absence Medical for putting this series together. Uh, it's been a phenomenal series. And uh, as a reminder to everyone, this is a recorded webinar. So all this webinar will be hosted on the YouTube channel on All Current Physiology and Absence Medical YouTube channel. Today, I'm really privileged to have um, a phenomenal experts in, um, in endovascular therapy and who are been using and going to speak to us about the peripheral burden of cardio, uh, peripheral artery disease in patients with coronary artery disease and how to uh, evaluate beyond angiography, beyond just looking at an angiogram or physiology study that is non-invasive. Starting with the first speaker is Dr. Uh, Gary Ansel. Uh, Dr. Ansel received his medical degree at the Ohio State University, where he also completed his fellowship in cardiology. He did a post fellowship training at vascular intervention at, uh, done at Auctioner Clinic in New Orleans. He is an interventional cardiologist and serves as the chief medical officer and president for Healthcare Insights, a strategic advisory partner. Uh, Dr. Ansel, innovative and pioneer in the vascular devices, and he has served as a primary investigator for numerous national and international research trials. Dr. Ansel, with no further ado, please go ahead and share your screen and um, looking forward to hearing your slides. There we go. Critical limb ischemia is the next frontier. I mean, treatment of multi-level PAD, aorta, aorta to mid palpateal, we have good technology and patencies. If you look at the distal palpateal to plantar arch, man, we just don't have a lot. We have PTA, which is associated with recoil and frequent repeat interventions drug-coated balloons, which have not demonstrated much use to date. We have stents in bare metal and DS, but none is, that, none is FDA approved and no good randomized trials would benefit. We do have intact vascular, which can um, actually seal up some very minor dissections and things like that. And we have atherectomy without randomized trials demonstrating benefit above PTA and certainly all associated with some amount of embolization. If you look at the diagnostic evaluation for the critical limb ischemia, it's really kind of interesting. We have pre-procedure evaluations such as ankle brachial index and toe brachial index, but they're associated with problems due to many of these patients having calcification. Duplex scans can demonstrate some occlusions, but we really don't have really well adjudicated data to say what are the stenoses. We do have CT and MRA, which are reasonable, but many institutions find it trouble um, imaging at the tibial uh, level. Certainly there's angiography, but as we all know, it's a 2D image, typically one to maybe a 25 degree angulation for another uh, angulation, and it's affected by calcification as well. We do have some perfusion imaging such as TCPO2, and, but that is real still, really still being refined and there's really no new devices that have been adjudicated to date. Periprocedurally, perfusion, all post-procedure. We have angiography such as blush, speed of the uh, angiography. It's really all artsy type of, of interpretation. We also have uh, contrast or dye or temperature based, again, very artsy with no good adjudication so far. Intraprocedural, we have angiography, which we've had forever. We have perfusion, which is in development. And we have what we're talking about tonight, which is pressure or flow wire, which is all hypothetical to point with just a few publications. Why do we need to do better intraprocedural with evaluation tools? Well, we already know if you look at the history of coronary disease, there's both under and overestimating the disease process. Typically, PDA, PAD is actually more diffuse in coronary disease. But unlike coronary disease, where we can get multiple angles looking at a stenosis, we typically get a monoplane or at the most, again, about a 25 degree extra view for these patients. And calcification is typically much more intense in the peripheral vasculature and it can affect all our intraprocedural evaluation tools. But what we, what we have learned from coronaries with the growth of FFR and IFR, we can predict clinical significance of lesions. 
we can predict the future events, we can evaluate acute result, and we can predict near-term outcome data after even putting in stents. And I think that we've paralleled coronaries many times in the peripheral vascular market, and it's now time that we get as sophisticated as the coronaries in our intra-procedural evaluations. For those that aren't uh, associated or really know what's going on, FFR, uh, especially for the um, myo, we call it the myocardial fraction flow reserve. This is the maximum myocardial blood flow in the presence of a stenosis over the normal maximum blood flow using a pharmacologic hyperemia. IFR, which is uh, what we call wave-free flow reserve, is a specific time in the diastolic pattern where the flow is ceased and we have diastolic distal coronary pressure over diastolic aortic pressure, and this does not use hyperemia. If we look at FFR for de making decisions in the cath lab, it's actually getting very well defined as to when we should use for diagnosis as really causing symptoms or really when we should really be doing interventional procedures, and we need to get to this in the peripheral vasculature. This is just a, a really for the, you know, the vascular people that aren't familiar with coronaries. This is the kind of sophistication you can have. This is a 49 year old male with unstable angina. And this is his diagnostic angiogram. You can see a moderate to moderately severe stenosis in the proximal right coronary artery using a, um, a hyperemia and FFR. We can see there's significant pressure drop across that stenosis. This is post a, a three millimeter angioplasty, really pretty reasonable result. I think a lot of people might've even walked away in the olden days from this. And you can see, however, that there's still a drop in the IFR now, I'm sorry, the FFR, and we're down to 0.81, so really not good enough. Now this is post a three millimeter stent, looks really nice. If that was a tibial vessel, we'd probably be done. But again, a significant drop post uh, adenosine or, or uh, uh, vasodilation that we can see, and we can actually figure out where that is. So actually we found that through a pullback that we needed to add both a stent distally and proximally. Now that's a good looking vessel. And now we don't see any significant drop in the FFR. Again, the oculostenotic might've left that all alone. So instead of being oculostenotic reflex to do more, we weren't gonna do enough. So can we potentially use this technique um, to really evaluate acute results and would it be useful in PAD? Well, I think so, because the PAD, diffuse disease is common. It's very often eccentric disease, especially the posterior wall. And oftentimes we, don't, we find you know, angulation to really see the extent of the stenosis very difficult. Calcification is common. We need to evaluate the intervention side, prox site, proximal and distal vascular bed. We need to actually come up with something that predicts wound healing or rest pain resolution. When are we really done? As we know for critical perfusion deficit, typically an ankle break index of less than 0.3 and a pressure of less than 50 is not good enough, but we don't even really evaluate these inside the procedure. And for even the clodican, we oftentimes will have occult stenosis uh, where hyperemia may actually play like an intraprocedural post-exercise post ABI, where we can really look and say, hey, where is this actually causing the claudication? And we can actually evaluate the entire vascular bed. So even though we may focus on a fem-pop lesion, sometimes we miss those iliac lesions, again, because they're posterior wall. We see reasonable contrast, and we're not getting the angulated views we really need to evaluate this further. There is some emerging data. If you look at we have uh, look in the literature from 2014, we have the value of uh, the, the uh, fractional flow reserve in isolated iliac artery stenosis comparison with post-exercise ankle brachial index, and uh, these are on your slides so that you can refer back to these. There's some initial experience with using the FFR in a hemodynamic evaluation of transplant renal artery stenosis, and we'll show you a, a little bit of that during the next during the end of my lecture and the next two. There's actually some data on the, uh, the value of uh, vascular flow reserve immediately after infrapopliteal intervention as a predictor of wound healing in patients with uh, foot tissue loss. And what we really also need is the assessment of the microvasculature after, inter after intervention as a predictor of wound healing in patients with tissue loss. So reasonable emerging data that we're starting to do the, the value of FFR, maybe IFR down the road. 
This is just a quick example of this, a patient with a renal stenosis. It's a young 45-year-old female. She's actually found at first to be hypertensive 20 years ago when she was 25. She had an abnormal screening MRA, which suggested renal artery stenosis, and her blood pressure is already elevated on one medication, which was started just a week ago, and she was referred for angiography. And it, just as you might expect, we found renal FMD. Now, I really challenge you to tell you or tell me how bad really is that? And what is the acceptable result when we're done with uh, plain balloon angioplasty? Because typically these don't really need to stent. Can you imagine if we had this kind of sophistication for the coral trial where we were only treating significant hemodynamic results? So this is the baseline FFR. We can see that using dopamine as our va vasodilator and that'll be addressed better by the next speakers. Um, we can see that there's a significant pressure gradient or low FFR from this. This patient underwent balloon angioplasty. Are we done? I mean, that's, we really don't know. What used to happen is you just got done and said, looks pretty good. There's no dissection. We'll see how they do. Well, because we had the FFR wire in there, we could tell the gradient wasn't well enough treated. So we actually upsized the balloon. And now it looks certainly a lot better, but is that enough? Well, the FFR would say, yes, it was. After vasodilation, again, there's no drop. Now we should expect to see that female have her best chance for getting off medical therapy. How about in the peripheral application? This is a 72-year-old male diabetic, dry gangrene. Um, unfortunately, non-compressibility, as we often see in the non-invasive studies. And geography, which I'll show you, shows severe infraproplatory arterial disease. And there's plain intervention to open up the intertibial and perineal artery. So this is the baseline stenosis. Certainly those are significant. You don't have to pressure wire those. But after angioplasty, are we done or aren't we done? Do we need stents? Do we need a bigger balloon? Do we need a longer inflation? All these questions, have we got the perfusion down into the foot arterialized enough for healing? Well, again, with the FFR and vasodilation, which could have been with Bepavirin or nitroglycerin, um, verapamil, sundry of different vasodilator agents, and we need to really come up with those better, we can see that we are done with that anterior tibial to that wound of the foot. So in summary, endovascular therapy needs to catch up to its cardiovascular counterpart. Endovascular therapy is handicapped by the lack of angiographic angles, and improved diagnostic tools are needed to improve the intraprocedural physiologic evaluation of our interventions and we need these results that are more easily interpreted than IVUS, et cetera, which pri provide primarily anatomic results. With that, I'll thank you and I'll stop sharing and turn it up back to our moderator. Thank you so much, Dr. Ansel. Uh, phenomenal talk, it's an eye opener for a space that we are not used to as cardiologists or endovascular specialists to use a pressure wire in the periphery. So now you are kind of scratch scratching the surface into this and uh, asking the the, the need for uh, physiology in the peripheral. What are the needs in terms of equipment, knowledge that need to be addressed before we move forward to see if this science is uh, important for our patients? Yeah, so I think that the big thing we need to do is one, we need longer wires. Um, what held us up early on, we, oh, gosh, we were doing this way back in 2005 or six, was the connections were not good enough. I mean, you, you'd use it for your diagnosis and then you'd disconnect, do your intervention, come back and all of a sudden you can't get your reading and you're putting another wire in. And like the OpSense, I mean, much better technology. We need it longer because many of our devices are over the wire. Um, yes, we can use it now with monorail, but I think that over the wire, we we'll probably need longer wires. Uh, but I think that as we get more clinical data and the longer wires, this is really gonna change everything because right now you guess when you're done. You can take off your gloves, go feel a pulse. Okay, how good is it? You know, there's devices out there, but we already have adjudication for ankle brachial and tibial brachial indexes. And we can use and, and help modify some of that with the pressure wire. We certainly need a lot more clinical data, but I think that it's really ripe and prime for us to get more sophisticated. Right. So I mean, the question that, that Paul is, I mean, as you see there on the screen, according to you, what is the primary reason why pressure wires are barely used in peripheral? I mean, as you address nicely, the current pressure wire do not work in the peripheral, they don't have it long enough. 
but the fact that it does not work, I think it does work, right? As long as you have the reach, reach if you have a, a FEMO or a CFA disease and you have the reach, I think it still work, give you the data, correct? Oh yeah, I mean, we that's why how we were showing these cases. You know, you, it works. It just, you know, there's you know, there's a couple little jumps or, you know, um, some made a little bit of change you have to do to get it done, but they work, they let you know. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, Hey, if I don't have any pressure differential between you know where in the area that I treated, I've really got a, a very good result. We know from the coronary literature and that you know it can predict whether your stent's going to stay patent, whether there's going to be restenosis, whether you're going to have a clinical effect, and in even from the surgical literature, I mean, when they were doing bypasses, having a twenty percent lesion you know ahead or downstream could affect your results, and a higher degree of stenosis really affected your results. So I think we're just getting more sophisticated because we can't get all the angles that we have in coronaries, even in the coronaries where we can get all those. FFR, IFR is now the standard of care. Absolutely. So I think a few of the question coming in are going to be addressed by the, the, the speakers. So maybe we're going to we can move on to Dr. Uh, Dishma. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dwight, if you don't mind sharing your screen, Dr. Uh, Dwight Dishman is an interventional cardiologist at UT Methodist a Physician located in Methodist Office Complex at Methodist South Hospital. He has been employed at Methodist uh, Labor uh, Hospital Health System since 2009. He was the first physician in the country to use Avenger Panteras device. He received his bachelor's degree in microbiology, uh, bacteriology from Southern University in Baton Rouge. Uh, and, um, and and in Louisiana, and he has doctorate of medicine from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. He's board certified in cardiology and interventional cardiology. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm sure a few of the questions uh, the audience are throwing at us now are going to be addressed by your talk. Uh, we're really looking forward to understand it more and how to use it, what hyperemic agent we use, the above and below the knee. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dishma. Again, thanks for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure to join such an illustrious panel and discussing this topic that's uh, still, uh, I think we're just scratching the surface. Uh, you know, and we don't have uh, a lot of data uh, in regard to um, FFR and the periphery. Uh, and that's largely why I think uh, there is some reservation in regard to using it in the periphery. And, and I think that gives us an opportunity to explore things more and, and hopefully a step establish some type of standard uh, in regard to treating patients even better uh, than we already are. Uh, you know, aside from the data being uh, relatively sparse and there being, being just a few studies, uh, we're also not sure as to the pharmaceutical agents to use uh, to induce hyper, hyperemia in the periphery. And again, uh, the protocols aren't very standardized. So, uh, as far as our educational menu for my talk, we'll review some of the current evidence uh, in regard to uh, peripheral FFR. Uh, and we'll look at the correlation, as Dr. Ansel kind of alluded to, uh, between some of the non-invasive studies and uh, FFR in the diagnosis and treatment of PAD. Uh, we'll look at the safety profiles for uh, peripheral FFR. And we'll try to increase some of the awareness uh, as to where FFR may be applied uh, in the diagnosis and treatment of hemodynamically significant lesions uh, in the peripheral space. Uh, so there are some limitations as Dr. Ansel uh, started to uh, touch upon in regard to uh, peripheral angiography. Uh, first and foremost, we're looking at a 2D image uh, of a 3D uh, anatomical uh, issue. Uh, and then we have limited angulation views. I think most of us, uh, by and large stick with the AP view uh, with some variation here and there, uh, 20 to 30 degrees here and there, uh, usually in REO or, early or LEO location um, or configuration. Uh, but there are other things that can't be accounted for uh, that may be contributing or causing ischemia. And that could be the length of the lesion, uh, the extent of the narrowing of the lumen, uh, the amount of tissue that may be affected uh, and even the viability of the tissue uh, that may be affected. Uh, and we can also talk to uh, the presence or absence of collaterals uh, that can cause a quote unquote steel uh, phenomenon and even uh, bypass grafts. So, so definitely some limitations there. 
Now, but also there may be some limitations of FFR uh, that may uh, prohibit uh, or at least uh, obstruct some of its use. Uh, and that is that we do require the administration of drugs uh, by and large uh, to induce hyperemia. Uh, IFR, of course, uh, can take some of that part away. Uh, but also it's invasive. Uh, we have to, you know, cross the lesion with a wire, uh, even though we have some technology that's uh, helping us with that these days, that's a lot less invasive. Um, it's time consuming, takes a little while longer to, uh, to cross the lesion, usually induce hyperemia and uh, interrogate uh, the lesion. Uh, at that time, it is an added expense, even though not that great, uh, but that's relative as well. Uh, there's some additional risk being posed to the patient by the administration of drugs and even the utility of the wire. Uh, and then uh, there are some anatomical challenges that can be met, particularly with calcification, uh, tortuosity, uh, and serial stenosis. Now, as far as uh, medications to be administered, you know, there are a lot of things out there that we can use to induce hyperemia. Uh, but by and large, uh, most roads lead to adenosine. Uh, and I think that uh, the most popular drug being used is adenosine, uh, followed by, especially in the periphery, uh, nitroglycerin. Um, but by and large, uh, when we're talking about the induction of uh, hyperemia, we use adenosine. Uh, back in the quote unquote old days, uh, this before my time, uh, there was a lot of papaverin being used, used uh, but uh, the limitations of papaverin uh, seem to exceed those of uh, denison. So uh, now, by and large, again, we use a denison. I think a lot of people are very familiar with ragadenison, which uh, is used for uh, stress tests a lot. Uh, but um, I think we're all familiar with a lot of the uh, other agents as well. So why is the denison good? Uh, some of the specificities is that, you know, uh, from an intravenous standpoint, that's the preferred route when uh, a pullback is needed. Uh, so an, an intravenous drip at 140 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Uh, and that's largely because, you know, the half-life is so short uh, that it, you have to give a continuous infusion in order to appreciate uh, the, uh, the persistence of the hyperemia in order to interrogate what needs to be interrogated. Uh, and we usually appreciate a brief increase in the systolic pressure uh, followed by a decrease, uh, usually by 10 to 20 percent. Of course, sometimes we see an exaggeration of that. Uh, and almost un uniformly, we see a burning sensation in patients, and uh, we tend to warn them that they're going to feel quote unquote funny. Uh, and most patients do feel that. Uh, we do tend to see a fluctuation in the PDPA uh, in some cases, and uh, oftentimes we also see uh, some AB blocks, but those are always transient. So another route uh, we give adenosine is IC or IA, uh, and that can be used in a lot of lesions, particularly if there aren't sequential lesions involved. Uh, again, half-life is very short. We're talking four to 10 seconds. Uh, there are rare AV blocks associated with the IC or IA administration. And again, those are still almost transient, uh, but the results are very reproducible. So uh, typically if you do it, if you don't trust the numbers the first time you do it again, you tend to get the same number. Uh, and over and over again. Uh, some of the medications that we may see commonly in the cardiovascular space that may interfere with adenosine uh, are some beta blockers. Uh, the carvalol tends to have the greatest effect. Uh, some alpha blockers as well. Uh, caffeine, of course. Uh, uh, Berlinta uh, may have an effect and uh, some ACE inhibitors. So just to keep that in mind uh, when we're uh, doing these tests. Uh, so what's the best route uh, to give it uh, in regard to uh, in, uh, IV or peripheral IV in the hand uh, versus IV in the femoral space or one of the larger uh, veins? Uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, tests were done, it's demonstrated that you know, the, the end result as far as the FFR is concerned is about the same, uh, whether it's given uh, via a peripheral IV versus one that's more central. Uh, the only difference is that uh, it takes, uh, of course, uh, a little longer time to induce hyperemia uh, from a peripheral IV as opposed to one that's more centralized. Uh, so no big difference overall in the result, however. Uh, so Dr. Ansel showed you uh, some of the uh, data that's available, some, some of the literature that's available 
uh, in regard to uh, FFR in the periphery. Uh, and this is one uh, that was done in 2014, uh, where they looked at the correlation between uh, ABI and peripheral FFR in aortoiliac lesions. Uh, and they actually found that uh, FFR uh, was more accurate than the peak-to-peak -peak, uh, gradient in assessing the physiologic importance of uh, aortoiliac aorto lesions. And I think that that's important because uh, I think most interventionalists uh, tend to use the peak-to-peak you know, -peak gradient uh, as a pullback, kind of as the gold standard uh, when, designing, when deciding to intervene or not. Uh, and, and I've been guilty of that you know, for years. So uh, the fact that the FFR uh, was demonstrated to be uh, you know, more accurate, uh, I think was very significant. Uh, another uh, study that was done also in the aortoiliac aor arena uh, showed that uh, there were, the FFR again was a very significant uh, non-invasive indicator of significant aortoiliac aor disease and was a good a test to uh, determine whether or not uh, a lesion should be intervened upon uh, based upon its hemodynamic significance. And we applied that uh, in this case that we did uh, where a patient had a relatively tubular lesion uh, in the uh, external iliac here. And we did uh, interrogate this lesion with FFR and found that it to be 0.72. Uh, and we subsequently uh, stented that and got a beautiful result. Uh, and FFR, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was definitely greater than 0 0.9 uh, after the intervention. Dr. Deschmont, so I'll stop you for a second. Usually, sure. traditionally, what you do in this iliac lesion, you do a gradient pullback. Exactly. What Did you perform pullback here or just? Yeah, we did do a pullback here, um, and, and this is one of the first lesions that we interrogated with FFR um, uh, to determine its significance. Uh, the pullback here was still more than 20 millimeters of mercury, uh, so it didn't change my decision to intervene or not. Uh, it, it was more uh, educational interrogation than anything. Uh, and furthermore, uh, there, if you can see that there's also a lesion just, uh, just proximal to the common femoral artery uh, okay. that we interrogated uh, to see if it needed to be intervened upon or not. And uh, the FFR there was okay, so we decided not to intervene there. I mean, looking at it now, angiographically, it's kind of subtle. I mean, it's uh, maybe some aneurysmal changes proximal, exactly. but, uh, but I think definitely the pressure where it did help um, delineate that flow limiting lesion more. Exactly. Uh, so furthermore, uh, we decided to uh, look at some more literature uh, to look at the significance of FFR in the, in the SFA, uh, which is where we tend to see the most disease. Uh, so this study, uh, they looked at the use of papaverin uh, in regard to the interrogation of uh, lesions in uh, the most traditional up and over uh, approach. And they found that uh, the contralateral femoral crossover approach uh, was useful in FFR measurement in SFA lesions. And in this case, uh, again, hyperemia was induced using papaverin. And we've been able to apply that as well uh, in several lesions. Uh, here we had a patient who had, as you can see, uh, a very significant wound uh, in the shin. Uh, and they had this very, you know, relatively focal lesion in the, in the SFA uh, that we interrogated with, with FFR. And it was found to be 0.68. Uh, now, after uh, atherectomy and subsequent angioplasty, uh, the FFR uh, was 0.94, and that proved to be uh, good enough, if you will, uh, to uh, support adequate healing uh, in that patient. And we had subsequent images uh, that was about six weeks after the initial uh, intervention, and another one that was uh, three to four months afterwards. Uh, that was almost completely healed. Uh, so uh, that again shows us that not only can we interrogate uh, whether or not a lesion is significant, we can interrogate uh, the uh, result of the intervention uh, to see if it's uh, indeed uh, uh, appropriate and significant enough to, for us to stop. Uh, and I think that especially in the SFA where we have a lot of uh, sequential lesions, uh, that that is very important. 
Uh, so this is another case that we did and the gentleman had, had um, postprandial uh, abdominal pain and subsequent weight loss. Uh, and I'm gonna apologize here because I haven't been able to get the video to play, but I can assure you <laughs> that is uh, about a 50% stenosis in the uh, superior mesenteric artery. And we put a pressure wire down, oh, you can see the lesion there. Uh, we put a pressure wire down and saw that the FFR was indeed 0 0.72 and we stented the lesion. And again, I can assure you, uh, it's a very, a uh, beautiful result there. Uh, you can appreciate the shadow of the stent. Uh, so uh, the question uh, was asked years ago, whether or not uh, the endovascular, endovascular hemodynamic pressure assessment uh, in lower extremities, you know, has the time come to, to pursue this? And yeah, I think that we're, we're there. Uh, I think that we have enough uh, fundamental data uh, to, to pursue uh, further interrogation uh, and study. So in conclusion, you know, the technologies in our endovascular armamentarium and protocols that guide the hemodynamic assessment of these therapies need to improve. You know, as interventional technologies and therapies evolve, our ability to assess the hemodynamic, the hemodynamic significance of these procedures need to become more refined to provide data that allow the vascular procedure list to more objectively determine the indication for intervention and the efficacy of the procedure. Thank you all. Turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Tishma. Really appreciate it. Um, before we jump into discussion, there's a, a poll coming up. Uh, where would you mainly use a pressure wire and peripheral vessel and the large vessel below the knee or others? I also have a question from Dr. Kern, maybe to the panel. Uh, what would be the gold standard for limb ischemia so that PFFR threshold should be established? Is the resting gradient insufficient? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think the resting gradient is is sufficient. Uh, you know, we always talk about what what's flow limiting, and, and it's difficult to say what's flow limiting when a patient is at rest. It's a little it's a little little different than uh, the coronaries because the coronaries are are always in motion. But um, you know. The short answer is no, I don't think that uh, the resting gradient is enough. Ansel or Alton? So I think that, you know, just from the data that we know from an on a basis studies, you want at least a pressure greater than 50 at the end of your result. But I think it has more to do with the end result of our procedures. And certainly we need a ton more data. But I think the big thing is to make sure you have optimized your inflow to that vascular bed to make sure that you have arterialized that foot if you can get the wire down in that area so that you know that you've maximized the perfusion. I think as far as what do we really need at the end of the procedure, right now we would follow the coronaries that we're looking for almost near normal FFRs. Um, that tells us that we really got as much you know, um, MLD as we can get. But I think there's a lot of data and this is ripe for a lot of research. What do you think, Alyssa? I agree completely. Um, I think that when dealing with patients with PAD, we go by a lot of um, a lot of factors, including their symptoms, their non-invasives, but functionally, some better data, especially in um, CLI, will be helpful to determine what's enough in wound healing. You know, is is single vessel outflow into the dermatome distribution of the wound enough? Um, is a bypass to that perineal enough? We don't know. We don't know, and I think it's a balance of the supply and demand. And that depends on the patient's resting state. It depends on the size of the wound. It depends on their metabolic um, output. It's, it's just hugely dependent on many factors. I feel like uh, really from looking at, uh, um, I never done it myself, but looking at the utility of this peripheral, I think post-intervention I, uh, resting indices, I think is going to be really a, a game changer. Um, if we utilize, utilize more, I, obviously, if you're doing it, if planning to do it post, I'm doing it before, even help you more planning, especially with the pullback. Uh, we talked about the pharmacology for it, but I think post also, sometimes we feel like it's okay, uh, but we give nitroglycerin before we do the final shot, we do a DSA, we're happy. 
but maybe there is a, a factor for recoil, especially for below the knee. And that recoil may be underappreciated angiographically, and uh, physiology will pick it up. Uh, but again, this is a space where we need more studies, uh, more data, and cases as well. An expert like yourself dive deeper so we know what to do next. All right, uh, moving along to the uh, Dr. Alton. Uh, Dr. Alessa Alton already shared her screen, is assistant professor at your university, Yale University. Uh, she graduated at Harvard College and Harvard uh, Medical School. She completed internal medicine training at Yale and cardiology, intervention cardiology, and endovascular intervention fellowship at Columbia. Her clinical specialties include coronary and endovascular intervention with a particular interest in the management and treatment of chronic limb-threatening ischemia. She serves as the director of clinical research in intervention cardiology and is committed to applying novel technology in the care of patients. Thank you again, Dr. Alton, for being uh, uh, with us, and uh, it is always delightful to see you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to share this case and for being on this panel. So I wanted to share a case of uh, hemodynamic assessment in a patient of mine with chronic limb-threatening ischemia. I have no conflicts of interest. It's a 77 year old man. He has CAD, had a cabbage in 1996, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, AFib on a DOAC, who presented uh, with a distal toe ulceration on his hallux, his third digit, and his heel. The wound had been present for three and a half months. He came to me after he underwent a PVI at an outside facility that was um, two months before he presented. And apparently a pedal intervention was attempted, but the wounds persisted. He was told that the next option was amputation if his wounds didn't heal, and he sought a second opinion within the VA system. His relevant medications include a high-dose statin, rivaroxaban, and an ACE inhibitor. He's optimized medically. His physical exam is notable for a left popliteal that's triphasic. And he has a left DP and PT that are both biphasic. Um, and PT is louder. He has wounds on his left calyx measuring 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 centimeters. His left distal third digit had a small wound of 0 0.4 by 0 0.3 centimeters, and his left heel had a bigger wound of 0.8 by 0.9. So his, um, his inflow until the popliteal was patent. You can see that his iliac system is free of disease. His common femorals are free of disease. He has a wonderful profunda, um, a patent and nearly smooth SFA, um, some disease in the P1, P2, and P3 segments of the popliteal. Um, and then most of his disease is the tibial segment. Um, so you can see that uh, perineal is, a, is occluded in the mid segment. Um, his PT, better view of it, it comes back distally via collaterals. Um, and his DP is occluded and comes back minimally distally via collaterals, and he has very poor plantar flow. So working from the right CFA, a six French 65 centimeter sheath was inserted. Um, the PT, so first we took the OpSense wire and introduced it um, into the popliteal just north basically in the distal SFA, equalized the wire and removed it. We then took the PT, uh, took, took a fielder FC and a Caravel microcatheter um, through the PT, crossed down to the level of the ankle. When we took the fielder out in exchange for the OpSense wire, pulled back on our microcatheter to get the measurements of our FFR. So the baseline FFR at the PT at the ankle was 0.63. So I've been experimenting with the best agent for vasodilation, and I gave 400 micrograms of nitroglycerin um, intraarterially. And after that, the FFR was 0.64. So then I administered peripheral adenosine, as is the coronary protocol, um, for one minute, two minutes, and three minutes, and measured the FFR at each of those time points. So interestingly, after one minute, it was 0.74. After two minutes, it was 0.79. And after three minutes, it was 
So this gets to this concept of what does baseline mean and what does um, baseline uh, vasodilation mean? And I don't know the answer. So uh, I attempted to wire down to pedal, I got the wire into the PT as you, as you saw before, um, got into the pedal loop and attempted to wire retrograde into the AT, but I couldn't connect it. Um, so I ballooned in the pedal loop with a small balloon, one five by 40, and then back into the PT with sequentially larger balloons, two five and a three oh. Then I went down the AT and attempted to access it. I couldn't stay true lumen and then decided to go after the perineal, which was also diseased, and um, ballooned down at the ankle with a 2.5 and up back to the reconstitution zone with a 3.0. So this is the final result. And I didn't know what to make of it because I knew that the previous attempt, they had tried to reconstitute the pedal loop and they couldn't. And the wounds persisted and he was told that because of his um, poor pedal vasculature, his next step would be an amputation. So then we did the FFR post and the baseline value of the PT, which was remember in the 0.6 range, now post was 0.91. And I only gave the adenosine for one minute because already by one minute, it had improved to one. So this is an example to me of an angiographic result that I wasn't exactly satisfied with, but a hemodynamic result that seemed reasonable. So despite the fact that I couldn't really visualize the pedal loop because I didn't have great outflow into the AT, um, the post FFR was normalized and his toe wounds actually healed um, within two weeks. And the healed ulcer most recently saw him last week is scabbed and now measures 0.5 by 0.5. So he's getting better. So the learning points for me of this case are that one, we can measure FFR in the lower extremity. Probably peripheral adenosine is reasonable for peripheral vasodilation. In this case, um, nitroglycerin did not adequately give a sense of his ability to vasodilate. And FFR may help to quantify the supply demand mismatch in CLTI and determine procedural success. And the future directions that I think about are, what is the post-intervention FFR cutoff that ultimately corresponds to wound healing? And whether the angiographic appearance or FFR is more likely to predict wound healing. So thank you very much for allowing me to present this case. Thank you so much, Dr. Alton. Great case. We have a poll coming up and we have a couple of questions. Uh, what is the most important product uh, specification for you to use a pressure guide wire and peripheral visual? We have uh, multiple choices here. Is it uh, pressure guide wire diameter um, or is it pressure guide wire length or a specific index to drive decision making? Uh, while you, the audience are posting their answers, uh, we have a question. Isn't uh, papaverin is a better peripheral vasodilator than adenosine? I think we touched on this on briefly, but uh, I'll open that to the panel. Um, so I guess I'll say that I don't, I, I haven't tried to measure FFR um, except so far with nitroglycerin and with adenosine. Um, it does theoretically make sense that papaverin would be um, an excellent vasodilator, um, but I'd be curious to what the panelists think. For sure, adenosine works. Yeah, I've never used papaverin personally, uh, but I know that there has definitely been a migration uh, in general in the vascular arena to use adenosine over uh, papaverin, but I've never used it personally. So I'm old enough, I've used power. <laughs> it works really well. The only downside to it is if you mix it with contrast, you actually get you know some uh, uh, coming out of solution, which can be really problematic during your case. So at this point in time, we would be using adenosine. Sometimes for the larger vessels, we use nitroglycerin. Um, you know, it's one of those things where the, the big thing for me is we're probably gonna have to walk before we run. And I think one of the big things from, from myself is that tibial interventions, 
the, you know, we're getting one plane, there's, there's oftentimes dissections, and knowing when you're really done just with your spot of intervention would be a great movement in the right direction because we're not stenting all these. We're oftentimes just doing balloon angioplasty. You know, then we're, we're saying, well, there's a little dissection there, so we're gonna put a tack there. But the, it would be really nice to know what we have at the end of the procedure. I can tell you it makes my procedures much faster because if I put a pressure wire down there and I've got a huge difference in pressure, I can actually pull back to see where the problematic point is. I can treat that area instead of retreating the whole thing and sometimes yeah. missing where I needed to treat. What do you think, Dwight? That's where I, I agree wholeheartedly. Where, you know, early on where I found it most useful. No, I agree wholeheartedly. I think it gives you more guidance in regard to when to stop uh, than, than anything else. Uh, and I appreciate the most for that. Uh, because I think by and large, uh, angiographically, uh, we're usually uh, about head on, uh, especially in the SFA and the tibials in regard to uh, the degree of, uh, of stenosis. But uh, again, with sequential stenoses, uh, you know, after the intervention, you know, that's where we need, I think, a little more guidance in regard to, you know, have we done enough? I like to what, what Elisa thinks just for one second, because if you've got a patent plantar arch, I mean, we've always had this angiosome discussion. Mm -hmm. but the reality of it is if you can put a wire around that plantar arch and it looks good throughout, do you need to intervene on a second or, you know, is that non-angiosome vessel that's going into the plantar arch good enough? I mean, do you think those kind of assessments are going to be critical in the future? So I think so. I mean, if we think about if we think about the surgeon's approach, they bypass a single vessel. And that's enough in a lot of cases. And that single vessel is often the one that's open. And that one that's often open is the perineal. Um, and what, you know, what's the dermatome of that? So I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that a lot of times I think when we when we say, well, the, the angiosome's better, I think it's because we're not getting good enough results up front. I right. mean, I, I, honestly, I think that you know, we're, we're suboptimal. There's, you know, there's already been by Iris Baumgartner, there's already been shown to be recoil after 15 minutes and about a significant portion of these vessels. So it'll allow us to evaluate our technology that supposedly helps with recoil beyond just the angiographic look at it. I think there's a lot of potential benefit from a research standpoint that will actually move and get more mature as a, as a specialty. I agree. And the other critical thing is that, you know, we only see one part of this, right? So once you, one, there's rich networks of collaterals. And once you revascularize those big vessels, the AT, the PT, even the plantar loop, it's all that microvasculature that comes into play that ultimately is going to save that, that limb. Exactly. Right. And it may help us figure out, you know, we've had populations of diabetics that still lose toes with good vessels, right? And the question is, is it because of microvascular disease? And this may help us identify patients that will actually benefit from our procedure, but maybe importantly, patients that won't benefit from our procedures. That's a great discussion. The other point I have is about the CTO. We know that currently the FFR, the donor vessel, usually there is, uh, you have to, there's a compromise of the physiology for the donor vessel of uh, that's feeding a CTO segment. And in the peripheral, Oftentimes you are crossing a CTO. So uh, the, the, the fact that, I don't know if there's enough data to say is what is the uh, cutoff for being significant in these cohort of patients or if before or after. And even if you open the CTO with physiology change after with all the present in the presence of all these collaterals. So um, I'm, I'm not sure this is done or have you encountered it before? And would this really change your management? I think in most instances, especially with CTOs, we're just trying to get the vessel open um, and get some flow. Uh, and, and again, angiographically uh, is guiding us more than anything else. But uh, I think that this entire discussion really opens up a, a huge can of opportunity uh, for us to, to pursue more research uh, to answer these questions. And quite frankly, it excites me. Uh, and I hope it excites, excites others. And I'm just going to throw like a rabbit question for you uh, based on the vascular bed for the iliacs, for a large vessel. IFF, uh, how about FFR? Is it reliable and easy to do? Yes or no? Yep. Very easy. Uh, it's very um, easy. 
about uh, FEMPOP, about FEM, sorry, femoral SFA segments? Again, very easy pullback, very easy. And it's reliable. If it's a sharp step up, that's a lesion. If it's diffuse disease, similar to the coronary, that means it's diffuse fissile disease. Okay. How about right. below the knee? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Bishma. Uh, uh, yes. Again, you can interrogate, you know, before and after. Uh, and I think, again, that after, uh, especially with sequential lesions in the uh, SFA, uh, definitely helps me more than anything else. Uh, and uh, again, to your next question, with below the knee, you know, typically below the knee, you need to get uh, an anti-grade stick in order for the wire to be long enough. Uh, it usually doesn't reach uh, up and over uh, for below the knee, right. unless you have a, a little old lady. So the only thing I would say is that it is possible to overcome wire length in the tibials. Um, so if you, there's certain microcatheters that you can blow the wire out over um, more simply than others. Um, and then you can reintroduce your wire through that microcatheter. There's, I've done a little bit of trial and error on that. It works. It's, it's fussy. And if there were a longer wire, it would certainly be easier. Right. Um, but it's absolutely possible. And, and what you're really using, it really depends on the diagnosis. I mean, one of the things that I find very interesting is, I'm sure you two see it all the time too. We see these patients in second opinion because they were significant cloticants. Somebody fixed something and they're still cloticating. Right. You know, they've gone to see the back doctor and, you know, all those kind of things. And, you know, it's really interesting because instead of getting a big CTA during the procedure, if you actually check and make sure that you've got rid of the gradients with a good FFR at the end, you can tell this patient should not be claudicating, you know, and, I, and it makes it a lot easier post-procedure to say, listen, if you're still claudicating, we got to look at your back, you know, but if you're, you know, you should be treated. And it helps us find a lot of occult stenosis because again, in the peripheral vasculature, it's often a posterior plaque. So you may not even see it from the AP view. That's a great point. Great. Um, there's a question coming. Uh, could angio derived FFR work in the lower extremities similar to the coronaries? Yeah, I think I kind of alluded to that uh, talking about uh, you know the technologies that are available now, uh, particularly in the coronary system. I haven't seen any data on it. Um, I don't see why it couldn't work, uh, yeah. but I, had, I just haven't seen any data. Yeah, it'd be interesting because you know it takes so long to get it right now. <laughs> That's it's true. faster, we may be able to do those kind of things. And I mean, it's the same physiology. We should be able to get it, you know, without you know, I would say a lot of trouble. Um, not my area of expertise, but if you can do it in one blood vessel as long as you can get the view. And in fact. You know, the patient has less movement, you know, in the, in the uh, peripheral vascular bed, so it should be easier. Right. I mean, that's really, it's been a great discussion. Uh, uh, Linda asking uh, essential presentation on a number of level concerning the whole patient vascular story, PAD, and the inter, uh, interrelation with the CAD is of interest to me. Thank you, Linda, for being with us. So what is your, um, have you used the, 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 uh, especially with absence wire, uh, what, what has make it different compared to other wires, especially in the peripheral uh, space? Boy, Lisa, you go first, but I mean, I, I think it's because reliably I can reconnect and it still works. Yes. And, you know, when things get really, as, as Dwight pointed out, it's an extra expense. And if you have to do now, Gosh, you did some of it. Now the wire's not reconnecting. You're not getting a good signal. I mean, you, you start to get negative reinforcement for trying to be a better scientist. And I think that that's one of the nice things by Opsense. I mean, it gives you a good signal. You can reconnect you know, reliably. Um, you can get some bends in those wires and it still seems to work very well from my standpoint. And that, you know, we're beating these wires up in the purple vasculature you know, quite a bit. So I think a, a more reliable set like Opsense has made, it, made my life a lot easier. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the ease of use um, is definitely uh, of great benefit. Uh, you can use it to primary wire a lot of these lesions. Uh, you can use it to intervene, you know, over the wire. Uh, uh, but definitely that ease of use in regard to connecting and reconnecting, uh, disconnecting, it's extremely easy compared to um, you know, other wires uh, in the same field. So. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. 
So usually you do a physiology and then exchange for a long wire and you work on that long wire and eventually drop the, the opti wire again. Opti wire again. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, any final comments uh, from the panel? Uh, otherwise, I'm just uh, as you're putting your thoughts together. I just want to make sure uh, our audience is aware of our next webinar, which is going to be on June 22nd. And that webinar, we're going to be wrapping up Sky and Euro PCR on all the science that came uh, or going to be coming on coronary physiology or peripheral physiology. Um, it's going to be also a live demonstration of uh, a physiology case uh, we're using uh, Opsense technology. So please stay tuned and save the date for June 22nd. Uh, any final thoughts, comments? We need Great to we, we need we need to put this webinar in a manuscript, and I think this should be it really. You, you are really not beyond scratching the surface. I think you are diving deeper than anybody else in terms of using physiology in the peripheral, and I think that's can be become like a, a white paper or concept paper um, to the, to answer a lot of questions in terms starting from technique equipment pharmacology, and also pre and post interrogations. Exactly. Um, if there's an, an opportunity to collaborate and using this platform, and this is part of it uh, to be educational, which is the main objective of Opsense Medical, uh, definitely this is an opportunity for all of us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for being here and thank for all the audience. Uh, thank you Opsense for sponsoring this and uh, till next time, please be safe. <laughs>